All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Helen, and um, I just really like typography, which is why I spent like hours making this animation. Um, <laughs> so content is the most important thing on your site. I think we can all agree about that. But typography is how you dress it up. So the clothes that you put on every day express like purpose for your day, and that's what typography is doing for your website. So assuming that you're not just like using emojis to like, I don't know, express semantic meaning on your sites, you're using typography, and that same typography is in the equation of what's making your users feel like using your site in the very first place. So you want, if you're like me, you want people to be happy when they're using their site, like this little dude, and um, you want your type to be really beautiful. So it would be really valid to ask, like, so what does it mean to have beautiful web typography? And like, what are the steps from knowing li relatively little about typography to making typefaces beautiful? Um, and then, of course, it would also be really relevant to ask, like, well, how do I make it all performant? Like, it means HTTP requests and additional load time and potentially poor user experience, like obscuring the content that I care so much about. So going to answer this first question first. What is beautiful web typography? And um, to do that, you have to know that typography doesn't just exist on the web. So if you want beautiful web typography, you need beautiful typography first. And so as with most things in life, a little history doesn't hurt. So this guy is Johannes Gutenberg. And he and his printing press marked the birth of modern typography. But written language stretches way farther back than the 15th century. So. Before Gutenberg, religious men and scholars all over the world were trying to pen history by hand. So calligraphy, the art that typography is based on, is really, really old. It's like hella old. All right. So um, do I have any UX designers in the audience? Yeah, I'm a UX designer. Cool. Hey, y'all. So when you're trying to create a new website or app, you draw from patterns that you've already seen in other places that work well. This is because choosing patterns users are familiar with helps them acclimate to your product faster. So here, this page is like really busy, but this is just like apps that all have the same kind of navigation, which is that bottom bar on iOS. So typography over the years did that exact same thing. It copied from its predecessors. Those religious men penning history created letters and alphabets and words and the way that those things looked on the page. So when this technical revolution hits with Johan and his um, um, printing press, it, it copies what these men had been doing. And even now, typography draws from inspiration from the way that we write on paper. So the technical revolution, that's Gutenberg, and that's where typography begins. So typography copying the way that we write and technical revolution means three patterns emerge. So the first is that typography and what we as readers find legible change and morph together and are influenced by how, like, by how we're reading, be it by book, be it by newspaper, or be it by website. The second is that typography is also influenced by the way people write by hand, and it borrows solutions people find when writing by hand when it needs them. And then the third, it's that typography becomes fundamentally different from traditional calligraphy because of the ways that printing presses work. So instead of letters being coupled really closely together, printing presses force like every single individual letter into a little metal box called a slug. So I found this really great tweet, um, and it says, the difference between what you see on a keyboard and what is available in a font is often staggering. And then you see like, you know, just kind of what you're used to seeing and then like all of the various glyphs that might be in a typeface. So if we think of this phenomenon as something that happens because typography was copying a previously established rich art like calligraphy, this makes sense. All of those extra things that you don't see in that font are problems that people when they're writing by hand just like solve with a pen, like this person, this person's talented. Um, but when you need to fit everything into a keyboard, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So. When we look at all the glyphs and the characters that a font has, when we look at all of those features a font might have, you can understand their relevance and the functions they serve a reader by keeping those three facts in mind. So typography needed to create glyphs or characters for all of these permutations when we write, and it was really challenging because printing presses meant you need to have every single character in a little metal box. So before we get to what all of those individual little metal boxes are, let's brush up on our 15th century European history, talk a little bit about this guy. Um, so the question is, why did printing presses change written words so much? So to understand how we got from calligraphy to typography, it's really useful to understand how a printing press works. 
So to print books with a printing press, you set all these metal bars called slugs, each with a letter or combination of letters and rows. So these are all of like the things set up on giant like wooden bookcases sort of, and this is sort of what they look like. You set them all like next to each other one by one. It's very exhausting, I'm sure. And they need to be set up this way so that they can be movable and they can be interchangeable so that each page can be different. So written word before the printing press, it was really easy to fix like awkward spacing between letters and acronyms and body of text flowed. And if you were talented, adding flourishes was really simple. Printing presses needs were different. Typography needed to solve awkward spacing, build flourishes, and have number fractions, like all of these things that had been solved and were easy to like, write, but were not easy to typeset. So Ellen Lipton in her book, Thinking with Type, puts this really elegantly. She says, the first typefaces were directly modeled on forms of calligraphy. Typefaces, however, are not bodily gestures. They are manufactured images designed for infinite repetition. All right, so to solve these issues, type designers had to create all these glyphs that you find in fonts today. Back to this guy, um, all of those. So slugs meant that as a type designer, you had to choose and find important combinations of letters. You had to give decorative glyphs for people printing books. You needed to create small caps and you needed to use like often used fractions like one over two, one over three, one over four. So if it wasn't obvious, this is like the direction we're headed with these talks. These little things make your content shine. And using these beautiful little characters that were specifically created to solve specific kinds of problems makes your text more legible and it makes the details just a little bit more beautiful. So the need for these characters didn't go away when we switched to digital typography, which is why the ability to turn these things on and off is in CSS. So when we use typography on the web, we have a myriad of characters and glyphs at our disposal, all of which can be turned on and off with like open CSS, open type CSS flags. And there are a bunch of them. There are like over 100. There are so many, so I'm not going to go over every single one. But we can learn some of the most common ones. So the f first one I want to go over is kerning. This one is the adjustment between letters so that spacing looks good. So type designers put a lot of work into figuring out spacing between your letters. So it makes sense to actually turn this on to auto, which ensures the browser will choose the most performant kerning option on by default. Um, there are also ligatures, which fix awkward spacing combinations. So this one, if you look at the F and I and finally, you'll see that like, one looks a little less awkward, and it's because it uses the little like, hook on the F to become the part of the I. So these are normally split into normal and discretionary lig ligatures, which is basically like normal ligatures used all the time and the fancy ones for later. Um, so there are also small caps. So if we watch CSS in here, um, these make abbreviations look good in sentences. So this is because they don't interrupt the flow. So here we see like the CSS like pokes up above all the other letters and the other version just is like the designed version for them to be a little flatter. Old style numerals give you numbers that go below the baseline, which look more similar to the way that you might write numbers out by hand. And it has the added benefit of making them a little more legible. Um, and then there are also swashes, which allow you to be super fancy. If you look at the A, one is like super fancy for like a header title. And then there's kind of like the boring one. So any one of these changes in the grand scheme of like all of the work that goes into building an entire website is relatively small. But together they have this net gain that is bigger than their individual parts. They make type more legible and thus your site more pleasant to be on and to be reading. So, these things are pretty easy to turn on. They're ultimately just CSS properties. I left them all unprefixed for brevity, so we have kerning ligatures. Um, so the most challenging part of this process actually is figuring out what your typeface supports, and there are like a variety of methods you can use to figure that out. So the first one is Typekit. I think most of us probably are using Typekit to get fonts or Google fonts. So if you're serving it up from Typekit, um, it will list the features that a typeface supports. Once you've created a kit on Typekit, you can see the open type uh, features the typeface supports by clicking on the question mark next to open type features. And then you kind of just need to already know what that means, which is a little inconvenient. Um, for Google fonts, you need to, or like fonts you have locally on your machine, you kind of need to do a little more digging. So 
in these instances, there are open type sandboxes. So the sandbox I'm using here is hosted at the URL, which is clagnet.com slash sandbox slash CSS3. Um, and I really like this one because you kind of just like click like things to see if it exists in the typeface or not. Like a few of these things are on. Like I think there are discretionary ligatures between the S and the T. So the last challenge is discovering all of those extra glyphs that a font face might contain, since we already know from, from this tweet that sometimes there are additional characters and glyphs that you can't access without key commands or help from some sort of like visual editing software. So to find these, you have two options. So you can look at all of the glyphs in either font book or character map if you're on Windows, or if you have like a spare 600 or so dollars just like sitting around burning a hole in your pocket, um, there's Adobe InDesign. Um, so I'm gonna go over this version first because I assume this is the one that's probably more likely for everyone in the room. So you can use Fontbook if you're on a Mac or Character Map if you're on Windows. In Fontbook, you can toggle the option to see like all of the glyphs that exist in a typeface by clicking um, that one with like, if you look up in the upper left, just kind of looks like a grid. And here we're just going through a typeface called Kalendaz, and we're looking at all the stuff it has. Yeah, it has all these fancy characters, it's nice. So if you do have InDesign, um, if you have a license for Adobe Cloud Services, um, there's actually a glyphs panel where you can just see everything. Kind of the same deal. So, the workflow that I have for playing with a new typeface that I'd like to use is typically to use an open type sandbox to discover the CSS features that a typeface supports. And then I go into Fontbook to discover the glyphs that might actually be cool in my designs and I just don't know that they're there. So for example, if you're on a Mac, the system font is called San Francisco. Um, and it has like all of these cool little wingdings, like it has like a little Apple logo and it has the location icon. It also has like super fancy quotes. Whoa. Um, so it's also a way um, using the information panel to see what languages a typeface supports, which is really good information if you're building a site that needs different character sets or languages with lots of accents. All right, so the next part, we should talk about performance. I don't know why performance is a text editor. I guess it starts there. All right, so at this point, you've already learned about type features, you know where to find them, you know how to turn them on. You might already have some opinions on what like, you think looks good and what you want in a typeface, um, either because of this talk or things that you've read on your own. And so at this point, we're going to pretend that you've chosen a typeface and now you just wanna load it and use it on your site, so, which is why we need to talk about performance. So I'm sure we've all seen this kind of happen where like, Sometimes like, it takes a little bit for like, you to actually see the content, other things load first. So, often as, so obviously as web developers we care about performance and we don't want large web fonts slowing down the load time of our sites. So at the very beginning of this site, of this talk, you probably remember me saying something like content is king, like we, content is the most important. So I want you to keep this in mind because as we go through these performance tips, it's the driving philosophy behind what we're doing. Um, so I think that Chris Manning put it best in his article on font loading techniques. He says that readable content trumps custom fonts, and it's true. So if you've ever loaded a web font from Google Fonts, you probably copy and pasted their suggested import code, which looks something like this. It's just that import statement, or it looked something like this, where it was like the link rel. And these are both, like these both get the job done, but we can definitely improve on them from a performance standpoint. For one, they cause something that is called FOUT, which stands for flash of unstyled text, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, even worse, they can actually cause another syndrome, which is called um, FOIT, which um, is a flash of invisible text, so not even being able to read anything before that entire um, web font loads, which is awful on mobile or if you're on poor Wi-Fi. And so, it's safe to say that if you're just trying to read something, you just want your users to be able to read, like a flash of unstyled text is better than a flash of invisible text. So when we're working with web type, we want to allow for flashes of unstyled text to happen, and then we want to mitigate and minimize their effects. So first, we're gonna go over how to prevent the flash of invisible text. And the way that you do this 
is with all the fonts you know and love, just like regular old web fonts. So like web safe font stacks, these are all just gonna load really easy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna declare um, a web safe font first in our stack, and then we're gonna use JavaScript to load in the web font once it's ready to lose. So for these, I'm gonna be using a typeface called Calendars. Um, so in here, this is probably all stuff you're familiar with if you've ever used a custom font. We, um, first we're just, loading it in, the at font face. Um, this won't download until um, it's actually applied to anything. So here we're declaring our web safe font stack first on the body, and then our desired font stack in a class called just dot fonts loaded. Um, then we're gonna use, for the JavaScript, we're using a library that's produced by Bren um, Stein, who works at Typekit, and it's called Font Face Observer. So once we have that library loaded, um, we're gonna start an object with different font families we wanna load. So here we just have one typeface with two different weights and we can keep appending different families. It all kind of works the same way. So first we create a new um, font face observer for each family in the object and these will each return a promise that is resolved when the font has loaded or rejected if the font fails. Um, in the promise we handle two use cases. So in the event of the promise being fulfilled, we add that fonts loaded class to the body that will trigger the typeface from our CSS and then apply the calendars plus typeface, which looks so nice. And so it ends up kind of looking something like this where like if you didn't catch it, it just loaded in the new font. Woo, there we go, nice. All right, so the next part that we wanna do is we kind of wanna minimize that like shift between one typeface and the other. So we wanna minimize that flash of unstyled text. So to do this next part, we're gonna compare the font we have with the font we want when we're choosing our stack. So this trick comes from Tim Brown, who explains the philosophy by pulling a quote from Jason Santa Maria's book on web typography. And he says, the thing I try to avoid most in my designs is not fout, but a jarring shift in the layout when a web font finishes loading. The shift is usually, usually due to sizing discrepancies between your layout and your system fonts and your web font. So what he's trying to say is, is that um, it's comparing the difference between like the size of the typeface vertically and then the size of the typeface like horizontally. So the way that Tim Brown handles this discrepancy is by matching his fallback font with his intended web fonts X height, which is what you see here, and the typefaces um, width, which is like the literal width of them just all laid out in the line. So here, I'm, if you remember, we're using Calendars. The closest web safe font I could find was Georgia, um, and the, right now they're both set in just like 36 points. So this trick is fairly simple. You just literally put them right on top of each other. Um, so when we do this, we see that um, Georgia is actually both taller and wider than Calendars is, so it's gonna move the content when we load in the new font. So to fix this problem, we just bump down uh, Georgia one point, so we're gonna get a closer match between these two. So here, when we overlay them, we now see that they have like similar X heights, they seem about the same height like vertically, um, Georgia is still a little bit longer, but it's a lot closer than that other version that we had. As Tim Brown puts it, he says, the style doesn't matter so much, it's just that it has to flow the same way. You don't want entire words like moving around once the new font loads in. All right, so we now need to change our CSS a little bit. Um, so instead of just applying serif, which was what we did before, we're applying Georgia first. Um, and then we're specifying a font size, which is what we found we found that 35 worked pretty well, so we set the font size, and then um, on Calendars, we set a new font size. So we go from 35 to 36. And it won't work because I spelled size wrong, but it's fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so wait, there's more. We can do more. All right, so if you're loading in a typeface from Typekit or Google Fonts, this is gonna get you pretty far. Um, already you know that you're gonna circumvent like that flash of invisible text, which is the worst and then you have a lazy load so that your users can read their text and get a nice web font, which is awesome, but we can still improve on this. So for this next part, ooh, okay. So for this next part, Zach Leatherman from Filament Group has um, this even more granular way that he handles lazy loading. So what he does is he splits up um, he splits up like the normal or Roman version of a web font from its italic, bold, bold italic, all the different weights that you want to load in. And he only 
like he first just loads in the, he splits them up into stages. So he'll just load like the Roman and then he'll lazy load the italic bold, bold italic like all afterward. So he calls this foft flash of faux text. Um, so this is like the third one. There are so many, you're just gonna have to remember them. Moving on. All right, so he handles this using a polyfill called uh, font face onload, and it executes a callback when a font, web font loads. So to use it, we load in his library, and then we set up our loads to happen in stages. So stage one, we're loading in that like normal version of the typeface, and then in stage two, we're loading in, you know, like the italic and the bold. So for these, we're gonna use a typeface called Proxima Nova, because it's popular and it has lots of different weights. So here we're loading in just that Roman version of our typeface first. So on completion for that variant, we then have two more checks for the bold and light versions of our typeface. If these succeed, then we add a second success class to the top element of our page so that our CSS knows when to apply like the correct font file. So our CSS is a little crazier now. Um, so first we load in our web font using an at font face declaration. Like we said before, it doesn't do anything until like we apply it to something. So because we're grouping them together, um, so we actually are splitting them up. So you'll see that I have like an at font face for Proxy Nova bold, and then I have another one for light, and then I have another one for regular. If you group them all together, then you're gonna get that flash of invisible text, which is like numero uno, wanna avoid. Um, so, First, we're declaring our web safe fonts um, that closely match our desired font, just like we did before. You're familiar with this. Um, so the closest I could find to Proxima Nova on the Mac system was the system font San Francisco, but the system fallbacks for Windows and Linux didn't match as closely. So instead of having the traditional fallbacks for Segoya UI and Tahoma for Windows and Linux, I'm just setting it to Helvetica and then Sans Serif. Um, next, we set a loaded class called Proxima Nova Loaded where we set our desired web font, and this is all stuff that you've seen before. So the new stuff, um, stage two. Here we start seeing some new code, so we see a Proxima Nova B loaded class. And this is the class that our JavaScript sets when the italic and bold versions of our typeface have loaded on the HTML element. We have to redefine in what instances we want italics and bolds to load since we completely stripped them out earlier in favor of like the browser's algorithms for bolding and italicizing, um, which is why we're resetting like a proper font, like the proper web font version of the italic on the M elements and resetting bolds on strongs and headers um, to use the web fonts true bold and italics instead of the browsers. All right, so all of these have the potential to just like time out and that's okay because your content still loads. People can still read it. So there's this talk by Kenneth Ormandy that's really wonderful on web typography, and he tells this story about this printing press, but he tells it 100 years after Gutenberg in the story that we just covered earlier. So 100 years after the printing press was created, a man named Pierre Altan was trying to recreate Gutenberg's greatest accomplishment, which was printing the Bible. But Oltan wants to do it for completely different reasons for Gutenberg. Gutenberg just wants to be able to do it, to say that he could. But Holtan wants to print like a mini Bible, and that's because Holtan is a pre Protestant living in very Catholic France, where he's unable to lug around like a giant Catholic Bible, um, or sorry, a giant Protestant Bible that he could get caught with and prosecuted for practicing his religion. And so you wanna know what his solution was? Yeah, okay. It was to make a better printing press. <laughs> okay, so that seems obvious. Like once we say it, like, okay, duh, he created a better printing press. But I think it extrapolates to our problems with web fonts. So as of last week, the HTTP archive had a chart saying that 63% of websites on, on the, like, have some sort of custom font of some sort. And that, to me, shows that we want to be able to use custom fonts. We just haven't figured out the efficiency part yet. We're still lugging around big, oversized Catholic Bibles, and we need to figure out how to downsize them. And that's not saying that things won't change, it's, and that we can't build better printing presses one day. It's sort of up to us to do it. So I think that as developers, we sometimes can over-execute on performance. We optimize everything without thinking about trade-offs and the things we lose by optimizing everything. So instead of letting performance dictate design, are there ways that we can build great designs that are performant and how can we make technology that supports the kinds of designs that benefit our users? 
I don't have answers for these things. <laughs> they're open-ended. I don't even think they're just questions for us in the room, but they're like questions for everyone who builds websites and who cares about their users. So we've decided that as an industry, based on those HTTP archive numbers, that we want web fonts. So how can we make better printing presses? All right, so stuff for you to follow up with this. If you really like type, um, Ellen Lefton has a book called Thinking with Type, um, and it's completely designed. It's very interesting. If you want to work with open type on the web, there are really great helper libraries. Kenneth Ormandy has one called Utility Open Type and another one called Normalize Open Type. They make working with open type a lot easier. Uh, Zach Leatherman, whose performance loading techniques I went over, he has like a bunch of research and he d gets even more crazy with all these data URI techniques that I didn't even cover. So that's also worth lo looking at. Um, if you want to read like a blog version of this talk, I have it hosted here. I literally switched the DNS at 3 a.m. this morning, so hopefully it works. If it doesn't, it will later. Um, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm writing a follow-up to this talk called All Typefaces Have Histories, which is about like how typefaces you choose invoke feelings based on sort of their own histories. Um, and then, last but not least, I'm over at the Developer Tools Corner in the other room, sharing tips for working with Firefox Dev Tools with my lovely colleagues. So please stop by and say hello. And then, lastly, thank you so much to ViewSource for having me, and thank you all so much for listening.